Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. The topic of our uh, discussion today is uh, fibroid uterus. Basically, I have uh, taken references from talk article about uterine fibroid and also um, from EBM book. Uh, basically, about uterine fibroid, we have uh, two talk articles. One was published in 2015. And that was about um, a review of the evidence-based management of the uterine fibroids. And in um, September 2017, uh, there was another article of talk, but that was specifically about fibroid in pregnancy management and outcome. So we will uh, just go through both of these articles and we will try to highlight some important points for you. Okay, so certain general facts about uh, uterine fibroid are very important. Uh, when we talk about its prevalence, um, the article shows that we have 30% prevalence of uterine fibroid. And um, the black women, the black African women have uh, incidence more as compared to that of the um, white women. Okay, so um, and it has been shown that uh, black women have the incidence and prevalence of about three to nine as compared to a white woman sorry it's had they had three to nine time more prevalence as compared to that of the white woman so the ratio is three to nine ratio one okay and um, another risk factor is also certain genetic predisposition okay um, it is in the genes of patient that she gets the uterine fibroid okay now what are they they are basically the benign tumors of the uterus and each fibroid arises from a separate cells also it has been shown uh, when we were talking about the risk factors not only uh, the genetic predisposition and a black woman have more prevalence uh, it is also shown that the um, those women who are overweight they get fibroid more as compared to those who are smart women okay so um, f is used for the mnemonic f that is 40 in um, the age of 40 it is very common fat fatty women it is very common and also in african it is very common so overweight women get it more and uh, when we talk about parity it has been shown that the nulli paris women get it more as compared to those of the paris women and majority of the uh, fibroid are asymptomatic many women get the fibroid but they are asymptomatic about one in four women are symptomatic and on what factors does the symptoms depend that depends upon the location of the fibroid where is it located and also about the size of the uterine fibroid if it is a large size then definitely it will um, the patient will get more symptoms more PV bleeding and more abdominal pain now this uh, figure I have also taken from the talk article and it shows the classification of fibroid based upon the location of the fibroid okay uh, later on I will show that um, the submucous type has further subdivisions a little bit complicated if we go staging uh, of this submucous fibroid is explained in this talk article but sometime the questions come related to that as well in MRCOG so uh, it's very important to memorize those staging as well anyway uh, here we will see that uh, we have different types of fibroid you can see we have sub serous fibroid okay inside the cavity we have the intra cavity fibroid we have a pedunculated type of fibroid having a particle attached to the different areas here it is attached to the fundus of the uterus and that is called pedunculated fibroid then in the um, muscular area of the uterus intramural area we may have intramural fibroid we may have submucous fibroid okay that extends toward the mucosa okay now uh, risk factors for developing fibroid i have explained it to you in the previous slide as well but uh, here um, 
in little bit more elaborate form black woman to white woman ratio is three to nine ratio one okay nelly parity overweight and fibroids have both estrogen receptor and progesterone receptor and progesterone also promotes the growth okay so those women who take estrogen and progesterone they get fibroid more as compared to those women who don't take it okay so these are the risk factors we need to remember and whenever we come across the patient we should ask these questions as well now we have the different classification of sub mucous myoma as i have explained it to you uh, here in the bottom uh, figure i have taken this from the talk article as well you are shown that you have sub serosal pedunculated type of fibroid sub serosal a simple fibroid not having pedicle we may have sub mucosal fibroid we may have intramural fibroid we may have cervical fibroid but the one sub mucous uh, myoma we need a different classification okay there is a specific uh, classification that is both european society of uh, gynecological uh, endoscopy esge classification and also figo classification okay so uh, when we talk about esge uh, what happens in type 0 in type 0 there is no myometrial involvement and the um, myoma is only in the endometrium pedunculated type it may or may not be pedunculated but uh, it is entirely in the endometrium okay so so that is stage zero type zero sorry when we go to the type one we uh, have two further classification less than 50 percent and uh, less than 90 percent less than 50 percent myometrial extension sessile okay and less than 90 percent angle of myoma surface to uterine wall okay what does it mean that um, um, if it makes lesser angle of 90 degree of myoma surface to uterine wall means if it is attached more toward the um, mean if it, it, it extends more toward the uterine wall then it would be like this like it will have less than 90 degree angle of myoma surface to uterine wall okay so both are included in type 1 less than 50 percent myometrial extension sessile and less than 90 degree angle of myoma surface to uterine wall what happens in type 2 in type 2 we may have a more than 50 percent myometrial extension it is also sessile and angle of more than 90 degree of angle surface to the uterine wall okay equal to or more than 90 percent of myoma surface to uterine wall means it is uh, extending more toward the uterine wall okay so that is a little bit complicated uh, esge classification uh, now let us discuss the figo classification okay and if we go from 0 to 8 we have different stages different classifications in 0 we have pedunculated intracavitary uh, and um, some mucous fibroid if it is less than 50 percent intramural intramural sorry uh, it is sub uh, it is stage 1 in stage 2 it is more than 50 percent intramural in stage 3 contact endometrium 100 percent intramural it contact in um, endometrium and 100 percent intramural okay and in four we have um, intramural type in stage five we have sub serosal of more than 50 percent intramural in stage six we have sub serosal less than 50 percent intramural in stage seven we have sub serosal um, pedunculated and in stage eight we have cervical or parasitic type of you try and pipe right okay now let us discuss the symptoms the symptoms include heavy menses pain dysmenorrhea dyspareunia dragging sensation in the abdomen urinary and bowel symptoms and rare before menarche and aggresses after menopause now the median fibroid growth 9% over 6 months fibroid are most common you try and growth each fibroid arises from the single cell okay now there are different uh, methods for the management of uterine fibroid 
um, and if you might have tried these methods in your clinical practice uh, mifenemic acid is very common and seeds um, whenever the patient comes with a pain related to uterine fibroid um, usually mifenemic acid is prescribed okay and uh, transexamic acid is also very helpful in uh, reducing the bleeding okay it comes in with the brand name of trans uh, transamine okay and different hormonal methods uh, like cocp can be prescribed progesterone or lee pills can be prescribed myrena uh, the intrauterine uh, device levonorgestrel releasing intrauterine system which releases progesterone that is also very helpful then we may have new modalities like gnrh analogs and uliprestol acetate and uh, in the in this uh, talk articles the role of these two types have been explained in a very good way okay so a little bit about the surgical management of uterine fibroid okay there are different techniques and day by day there has been uh, many advances in the uh, different surgical managements okay but uh, the uterine artery embolization is uh, a very effective methods for dealing with the uterine fibroid and it has uh, uh, several uh, several studies have been done related to it and uh, sh those show very good results in the patient okay then we may have certain new techniques related to mri mri a guided focused ultrasound okay so uh, MR, MRI or resonance imaging guided focused ultrasound so it's a combination of MRI and a focused ultrasound okay so uh, these are uh, advanced techniques we may have minimal invasive surgeries as well like a hysteroscopic myomectomy okay we do myomectomy but hysteroscopic guided and um, not only hysteroscopically but we can also do laparoscopic myomectomy to the abdomen we make holes in the specific areas and do myomectomy we do open surgery okay so hysteroscopic guided myomectomy laparoscopic guided myomectomy open surgery open myomectomy and in the end if all these fail then we go for hysterectomy okay uh, like uh, we try to avoid hysterectomy in the first five methods but if those prove to be ineffective we can go for hysterectomy to save the life of the patient okay uh, so a little bit about the myrena levonorgestrel intrauterine system it is uh, commonly used uh, worldwide for heavy menstrual bleeding and also for uterine fibroid but uh, the main problem in third world country is that um, it is very costly uh, it cost about um, eight to nine thousand rupees in um, in Pakistan so patients of um, uh, old age or those patients above 40 who have completed their families they usually go for surgical methods like they straight away say that we need hysterectomy but uh, the research shows that the immunological intrauterine system is very effective until and unless there are um, sir, um, such type of submucosal fibroid which should distort the cavity then in that case the myrena might not be effective otherwise it is very effective method of dealing with the problems related to the uterine fibroid okay so it is uh, widely accepted as an effective treatment of hmb as i have told you an advantage is that there is general agreement among several review that the use of myrena in a woman with fibroid is successful in reducing menstrual blood loss increasing hemoglobin and relieving pain symptoms okay so by reducing the menstrual blood loss and increasing hemoglobin it helps in relieving symptoms but there are certain conflicting evidences relating to it as well okay and um, uh, many people or those uh, who do research they say that this uh, myrena um, may not have effect on reducing the uterine volume and uh, the another thing is that the device expulsion rate is very high if the patient is having uterine fibroid gnrh analog very effective treatment 
it comes in the different brand names like um, Zolodex, like um, uh, Lupron, Vantas and different other brand names in different countries. But uh, the thing which is very important for a gynecologist is to know about this mechanism of action. Okay, uh, GnRH analog basically induce a menopausal state with a low estrogen level that may result in intolerable side effects and bone loss. The hypoestrogenic side effects could be minimized by adding low dose estrogen and progesterone or t after initial phase of non regulation. Okay, and GnRH analog treatment is therefore limited to maximum six months. Okay, and um, different studies shown that uh, it has um, the ability to reduce the size of fibroid up to 36%. This 36% is very important figure, very important percentage. And if it is used after 12 weeks size, then it um, results in improvement of the symptoms. So it is very effective because uh, not every treatment can be used in... Um, uh, you try size of more than 12 weeks but GnRH analog has shown to be very effective in reducing the size of fibroid up to how much 36 percent but the disadvantage is that if we stop giving GnRH analog the menstruation is returned in four to six four to eight weeks means in a month or two months time the menses uh, come back to their previous states and also it has been shown that the size which was reduced by GnRH analog that also returned to the pre-treatment level within four to six months time okay so it is um, although it has certain advantages but this advantages this advantage doesn't make it very favorite drug because as long as we use this drug it shows its effect but if it is stop the pre-treatment size of fibroid come back within the four to six months time but a very important advantage of gnrh analog is in the pre-operative use okay sometimes uterine size is very large but when we use the gnrh analog pre-operatively it reduces the uterine fibroid volume sufficiently to make vaginal hysterectomy or transfer since and for the abdominal approach feasible okay sometimes we plan vh but the size of uterine fibroid doesn't permit us in that case we can use gnrh analog to shrunken its its size okay and um, uh, when we uh, plan for abdominal approach in that case as well the um, reduced size is important because in that way we can give transverse insane instead of giving uh, classical insane to the patient okay so these are two very important advantages that is percent reduction in myoma size although sa having side effects uh, of uh, returning to its uh, pre treatment level but the important advantage is that preoperatively it reduces the size of fibroid okay so that is the main advantage that preoperative treatment with gnrh and logs make appears to make hysterectomy easier with the reduced operating time and shorter hospital stay now what is the disadvantage one disadvantage i has uh, i have told you that uh, after discontinuing it it, um, it results in bringing the size of the uterus back uh, to its pre-treatment level but another disadvantage is that there are concerns about difficulties in myomectomy in, op in obtaining the appropriate plane for dissection between the fibroid capsule and myometrium and that small fibroids were often poorly defined and therefore were missed in women with the pre-treatment uh, women pre-treated with GnRH analog okay there are certain research on um, GnRH analogs as well the surgeons have found that those women who use GNR channel log uh, it was difficult to find the proper plane of for dissection okay that's why this um, drug make it unfavorable and um, not favorite for the gynecologist to use it because the plane of dissection would be difficult to find out now another research was done by Dallas Dick 
at all. He reported that there was a blurred interface between myoma and myometrium and up till uh, obliteration of cleavage plane on anatomical and histopathological finding with GnRH analog used before the surgery. Okay, so that is the biggest disadvantage of GnRH analog use. I would not recommend uh, gynecologists to use GnRH analog based upon these disadvantages. Now something about uliprestol acetate. It is new selective progesterone receptor modulator and what is its mechanism of action? It causes the apoptosis of fibrides and it also inhibits the proliferation of the cells. Okay, so apoptosis of fibrides and inhibits the proliferation of cells. Now uh, you are seeing here um, there are different studies, PERL1, PERL2, PERL three uh, trials these are basically trials related to uliprostol acetate and these are written in the talk article uh, in the pearl one trial uliprostol was um, um, checked uh, against the placebo and was found that uliprostol had a uh, uh, better effect as compared to placebo in pearl two trial uliprostol was checked with compared with GnRH analogs and in that uh, GnRH analog was found to be very effective and in PERL3 long term use of uh, uliprostol acetate with the repeated cycles were checked and here I have a little bit explained uh, something more about PERL1 PERL2 trial that in PERL1 amenorrhea was noticed in more than 90% over 13 weeks and um, there was 41% change in uh, fibroid volume compared with the 18% with the placebo. Okay, so uh, uliprostol had better effect as compared to placebo. Okay, it decreased the uterine fibroid to 41% um, in, in case of uliprostol uh, and placebo decreased it to 18%. In PERL2 trial, fibroid volume uh, changed more than GnRH. Okay, so GnRH was found to be better than uh, uliprostol acetate but there was no difference in the menses. Uterine artery embolization uh, randomized controlled trials were there and um, there were 177 patients um, who had um, uterine artery embolization versus hysterectomy that trial was done and it was found that there were lower rate of the major complications in uterine artery embolization. Patient had ho uh, shorter hospital stay but increased the admission rate on uterine artery embolization okay so uh, um, as uterine artery embolization is not definitive treatment so there was increased readmission rate after uterine artery embolization another cochrane review found that uh, patient had better um, satisfaction quicker recovery earlier return to work but uh, it had more minor complication and five fold increase in intervention within the two to five years okay so question might come how much is the risk of increased intervention in case of uterine artery embolization that is the five fold increase rate of um, risk of um, intervention in the uh, four to uh, two to five years but there was no difference in ovarian failure rates now let us talk about the uterine artery embolization advantages and disadvantages advantage is that it, there is a 40 to 70 percent reduction in the fibroid volume okay so that is a big number GnRH causes 36 percent reduction in fibroid volume it causes 40 to 70 percent reduction in fibroid volume disadvantage is that one to two percent patients have ovarian failure and 2.9 percent may need further intervention further treatment in the form of hysterectomy now this table i have taken from ebm book okay um, because it's very important exam question might come related to this table like what are the complications of uterine artery embolization you can see the different complications with the incidences but the the um, highest incidence is that of the post embolization syndrome which is 16 to 18 percent and it occurs early within the 30 days okay the next common is that of the uh, prolonged vaginal discharge that usually occurs after 30 days and it is 12 to 16 person okay so that is second number first the post embolization syndrome 16 to 18 percent and prolonged vaginal discharge 12 to 16 percent the third is that of the spontaneous fibroid expulsion that is 7 to 10 percent and other you can see uh, on your own other risks are not very much uh, but the ovarian failure 
uh, risk is 1.5 to 7 percent okay in all ages and if um, we talk about under age 45 that is less than one percent so these are certain complications related to uterine artery embolization now surgical methods of choices for different types of fibroid uh, previously uh, in the previous slides we talk about the grades of um, uh, uterine fibroid uh, based upon the FIGO and uh, ESGE classification like in uh, type 0 or grade 0 there is no myometrial involvement um, the, uh, the uh, fibroid is entirely in the myometrium that is pedunculated or non pedunculated in type 1 uh, it is less than uh, it is having less than 50 percent myometrial extension in type 2 we have more than 50 percent of the my myometrial extension okay so here we are discussing the surgical uh, methods of choice for different types of fibroid that is why the classification classification is very important okay in grade 0 and grade 1 fibroids uh, can e be easily removed hysteroscopically but difficulties are likely to be encountered with a grade 2 which is, which is having more than 50% uh, myometrial involvement uh, in grade 2 fibroid we encounter difficulty as most of the fibroids are in the myometrium okay and the thickness of myometrium uh, between the fibroid and serosa is an important factor in determining the safety of hysteroscopic resection in the um, grade two uh, grade two cases. Okay, so thickness of myometrium is very important. So what we do then when fertility is not concerned, the combination of hysteroscopic fibroid resection with the endometrial ablation may be performed. In one study, ninety percent of women showed decrease in menstrual blood loss at one year's follow up. And uh, on review of the different techniques using the hysteroscopic myomectomy, I suggested that resectoscope slicing is a gold standard for intracavity fibroid, uh, although there is no single proven technique for fibroid treatment within the uh, intramural components, grade 1 and 2. Okay, so in the grade uh, 0, when there is no intramural uh, extension, we can do resectoscopic slicing. But this technique cannot be used in the grade 1 and 2 in which we have less than 50% and more than 50% of myometrial environment. Now, traditional methods of fibroid resection may be partly replaced by myolysis in which an electric current is passed through a needle to destroy the fibroid or cryomyolysis in which the freezing probe is used in a similar manner. Okay. Okay. So, myolysis, cryomyolysis. You need to know the difference. In myolysis, we use the electric current. In cryomyolysis, a freezing probe is used and these techniques can be used for all type of fibroid through laparoscopic or hysteroscopic routes. Now, let us talk about uh, another advanced uh, technology, advanced technique, which is written in the talk article, that is MRI, MR guided focus ultrasound for the um, uterine fibroids. High frequency ultrasound wave produces heat to denature protein leading to cell death and shrinkage of the fibroids. So, in this uh, technique, we use high frequency ultrasound waves okay major disadvantage uh, major advantage is that patients are having quick recovery and uh, very low morbidity but it affects the fertility of women and it is not recommended for women wishing to preserve their fertility and studies show that in the, within the 12 months time there are significant reduction in fibroid related symptoms and to less vascular fibroids with a low signal intensity on MRI were more likely to respond to treatment than high signal intensity vascular fibroid. Okay, so less vascular fibroid responded more. But uh, when we compare this technique, the MR guided focus ultrasound for uterine fibroid with the uterine artery embolization this technique this uh, mr guided focus ultrasound technique was found to have more need for uh, further intervention means sevenfold need for intervention within the 12 months time okay so that is the biggest disadvantage now although fda approves it in 2004 but the national institute for health and care excellence advises it's used only in the research and audit setting okay so uh, it is not widely used but uh, we should be aware of it now uh, this table shows the safety of pharmacological agents used for the treatment of fibroid in pregnancy and breastfeeding okay transexamic acid yes it can easily be uh, used in the pregnancy 
it is safe and in a small amount only it is released in the breast uh, the safety of mifenamic acid is not known okay and there is uh, a known risk with the NSAID in general especially in the third trimester of pulmonary hypertension necrotizing anterior colitis intracranial hemorrhage oligohydramia premature closure of the fetus ductus arteriosus and there is a lack of data for the mephalemic acid especially uh, okay and uh, amount in the breast milk too is small to be harmful uliprostol safety is unknown and manufacturer advices to avoid uh, its use in pregnancy because of lack of data and uh, safety is unknown okay and also in the breastfeeding the safety is unknown GnRH analog contraindicated okay and um, in breastfeeding also it's better to avoid it aromatase um, inhibitor avoid okay uh, norethestinone unknown um, but in breastfeeding it is safe though high doses may suppress lactation okay and NSAID for pain, conflicting data on the congenital malformation, no association with the stillbirth, fetal motor restriction, and pre uh, term labor. And um, the comments are same as we discussed for mephalemic acid, and especially invited in the third trimester because of several side effects. Okay, safe while, yes, a little bit, and uh, it shouldn't be used in uh, breastfeeding. Okay, thank you so much. That was a little bit discussion about the talk article about uterine fibroid. Love.